While the first session was directed a little bit more to the general overview and the policy, we are now going to deep a little bit into the, the real digital fields and have a look at a number of opportunities, challenges and knowledge gaps which are there in the field in reality. This is a meeting about digitalization and artificial intelligence. There's the reason that I'm sitting here most probably with an empty, <laughs> with an empty uh, table because all of my panelists will join uh, on, online. They're all on the screen. And as it is uh, the National Good Morning Day in Belgium, I would say good morning. But as, at, as one of my panelists is joining us from Japan, I should say uh, also good evening uh, to you. Um, the idea of this session was that we would have an opening remark by member of the European Parliament, uh, Irene Tolere. Um, she was not able in the end to join us because maybe you have heard of a number of uh, yeah, activ uh, activist uh, manifestations in France which are growing day by day and she really had uh, to return to France, so she's not with us. Okay, that gives us the possibility to deep a little bit deeper into, into the practicalities. The first uh, person uh, I would like to give the floor is uh, Kaili Juppets. She's uh, the, working for, uh, for PepsiCo already for 25 years, and she's currently the Global Procurement A-Group Tato Director. Um, she, in her key areas of expertise, that includes, but it's not the only thing, but it, ex it includes agriculture and digital transformation and data tools, uh, that makes that we have really someone who is within a big company on a daily basis involved with digitalization and with the upcoming artificial intelligence. Uh, Kaili, I give the floor to you. Hi, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. Sorry, I have a little bit of cold. Uh, that's the reason why I couldn't travel uh, this morning and be there with you. But thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Very interesting discussion um, in the first part. And um, yeah, so I represent PepsiCo and um, PepsiCo is very much <clears throat> an agricultural company. So we, we contract directly um, key crops like potatoes, corn, oats. My knowledge is more on the potato side. We have contracts with um, suppliers and we grow with 2,300 growers across Europe. So we have a quite a good connection um, to the farmers. And um, of course, we are very, very proud of these uh, partnerships. They go back to um, you know decades. Recently, last year in Poland, we celebrated 30 years of uh, Polish agro program. In some cases, there are suppliers across Europe who have been supplying us for um, for decades, um, for for, um, for generations. So fathers passing on the the businesses to their sons or daughters and still um, being our suppliers. So uh, we're very proud of that. And we've, we've, we've seen a lot of change through these, uh, these years, uh, going from different uh, varieties, um, implementing um, new varieties, um, changes in the store uh, chemicals, as the European Parliament probably knows, and um, now the greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction programs and so on and so on. Um, regenerative agriculture practices that we would um, also like to encourage and, and um, PepsiCo has, perhaps uh, some of you know, but PepsiCo has published uh, sustainability targets. And uh, one of the pillars is positive agriculture, uh, whereby um, we commit to growing in Europe 800,000 hectares under regenerative practices. Um, of course, in order to understand the progress, we need to measure, we need data to measure, um, see um, how the things are developing. And I must say that um, through my five years or so uh, experience in the data and digital um, ag, uh, um, area, 
uh, we've gone through many things that um, that um, uh, we heard uh, today from the keynote um, presenter, Professor B Bedemaker. Uh, it, it all starts with data quality. It all starts collecting the data, having accurate, complete, timely data, robust data sets based on which we can then build analytics, um, insights, um, in-season, post-season support tools for the farmers or um, AI or machine learning tools. So I, I give two examples. So for example, uh, we've got a platform, we call it uh, iCrop, uh, which is a um, robust data set um, for several years now. Uh, every season uh, brings a new data set. Um, and uh, based on that, we've developed several dashboards for analytics, for benchmarking. Suppliers like uh, a lot to see how, how they're doing. They also like to see how they're doing against their uh, competition. Of course, we, we will um, mask the, um, the, uh, the names, so the data protection uh, for us is, is uh, very important. But they like to see how their uh, varieties are um, uh, performing, for example. So how, how is the yield uh, trends? How, how is the quality trends? Uh, all, all of this is very, very important. And um, uh, we, what we provide in the iCrop platform, for example, is an irrigation scheduling tool. So that's based on water balance. Uh, in Spain, we saw that the uh, growers who didn't use the irrigation scheduling tool, only 50% of the crops were irrigated to the, to the water needs of the crop. When they used the, uh, the tool, then it rose to um, 80% uh, of the crops getting the water they need. So it's, it's, um, uh, it's quite an interesting... Uh, uh, statistic and and of course you know with all the water use um, uh, importance we don't want to over irrigate you also don't want to under irrigate so um, having having such a tool at your hands is um, is useful however uh, it needs um, data uh, input so it needs to the, the tool needs to know how much has been irrigated so again the data collection data input timely uh, um, uh, in the right way uh, is is the uh, is the basis how these tools will give useful outputs another example i will quickly give is that um, based on the data we've got in in our icrop um, platform we have um, developed um, uh, through tech uh, companies, we've, we've developed a uh, machine learning tool and we gave it the, the, the question what to solve, what drives yield. So it's, it's about yield optimization. Yield is important for the growers. It's their income, it's their livelihood. They want to get the highest um, income they can from the plot of land. Or uh, for us, it's it's the supply, so it's it deserves uh, both. Um, and um, uh, again, we saw uh, in the beginning quite um, doubtful um, uh, response. It um, you know it's like what's this? Uh, why is it uh, giving such answers? Or what is it saying? We don't understand how it works. Um, but now we see that it's, a, it's, a, it's becoming a useful tool that uh, our agronomists, when they talk to the, um, to the growers, are starting to ask. So let's see what the um, machine learning tool is saying. And uh, what it does is um, that it takes the data um, based on field data, weather data. Um, it, it, it shows what is driving yield up, what is driving yield down. And it also gives recommendation. So the tool gives what is the potential yield the field could have achieved and compares it to the actual yield and then um, gives some recommendations what the farmer could do to increase the yield. So those recommendations could be crop rotation, for example, or different irrigation or fertilization um, application, uh, change of variety, things like that. And... Um, uh, we see that it brings 
um, it, 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 we don't mandate these tools, but it is a complementary tool, and it brings a certain new viewpoint to the table. You know, it could it, it could bring up that um, um, the the, the um, irrigation should be higher, uh, but then maybe in the discussion we see that well, the farmer doesn't have the finances to increase the irrigation, so it it, it drives the discussion. It drives to look for value. It drives to look for ways to improve. Um, and uh, that's where we, um, we find it really useful. Um, how the future will be thriving, I think, for European um, uh, agriculture is a discussion with all parties. So through the supply chain, um, from academics, researchers, um, farmers, buyers, um, um, ag input um, or um, uh, or machinery uh, producers, consumers, retailers, and um, all all parties together to discuss it because there is still um, you know not full clarity on the definitions, on targets. Um, consistency of targets uh, that I think uh, that's what's what's coming but uh, um, from my perspective I see that um, data analytics is a great um, enhancement of how we uh, we can manage our business how the farmers can improve their business and um, I believe it brings a, a lot of value in the future Thank you uh, very much, Zach. Uh, you were giving us an overview on how PepsiCo, as, as a big company, is, 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 is looking at this, but is also thinking about how to support, uh, in your specific case, uh, your 2,300 potato growers to prepare them for, for, this, for this new age. Um, we have a next panelist, and um, there we go a little bit further into into the field uh, that is uh, Steve uh, Tanner. He's uh, the co-founder of uh, Eco Robotics, which is a company developing, producing, and selling uh, farming machines for sustainable agriculture, but exactly using artificial intelligence and robotics technology. He's at present uh, leading the product development, and so let's hear from him about uh, what is on the market and what uh, what we can do with it. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Yeah, we can okay. hear you loud and clearly. Okay, great. So thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. So I would like to give an example on how AI in agriculture can improve sustainability, uh, but while being simple to use and understood by the farmer. So as um, the interaction Interaction said, I represent Eco Robotics and we have uh, developed, we fabricate and we sell an ultra precise and intelligent spot sprayer called ARA. So it's a six meter machine, a wide machine, which is used behind the tractor like any uh, regular sprayer, but it uses cameras and artificial intelligence embedded on the machine to recognize each plant and take a decision whether to spray or not, depending on the kind of plant. Uh, with a spot spraying system with a very small spot size of a few centimeters. So this allows to spray only the weeds, for example, and to touch marginally, marginally the crops. It can process four hectares per hour. So the machine is in on the market since 2021. And last year, in 23, we had more than 100 machines running in Europe doing weeding on about 30,000 hectares on vegetables, row crops, and pastures. And we had an average herbicide savings of 85%, which is very high. In some cases, we even reached 95% of herbicide reduction compared to a standard sprayer. So this technology allows, we see that AI uh, allows to reduce strongly the usage of chemistry in conventional agriculture, but it also uh, allows to replace synthetic chemistry with simpler non-selective molecules. And this is quite new. Uh, until now, uh, chemistry on, in agriculture was depending on selective molecules. 
And the usage of AI allows to transfer the selectivity from the molecule to the application, to the robotic application. This allows to use much uh, simpler molecule, uh, which degrade much uh, better. And we can also spray uh, other uh, organic product, like, for example, biocontrols or insecticide and so on. So we, we think also that uh, strongly reducing chemistry and replacing synthetic uh, chemistry with natural chemistry will contribute directly to the regeneration of soils and biodiversity in agriculture. Of course, it's a supposition, we have to prove it, but we think that uh, uh, reducing chemistry will have a, a strong benefit on, on that. Uh, reducing chemistry also allows, uh, sorry, also allows to reduce CO2 emissions because a chemical uh, synthetic chemi chemistry is CO2 intensive to produce. So uh, even if the sprayer uh, AI needs uh, more energy to produce uh, or more CO2 to produce, it's largely compensated during the lifetime uh, of the machine thanks to the savings. So as a summary, the machine can be used everywhere as it does not need a connection. It's very easy to, easy to use, and we have farmers being able to use it after two hours of training only. Uh, and so the acceptation of this technology is very high. And uh, we do not share collected data. We use just the data to improve the machine for the benefit of all the users. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. It uh, gives us a little bit idea how this is implemented uh, in, uh, in the field. I move on uh, to our uh, third panelist, uh, which is uh, Beth Dewey. She's the head of partnerships of Donforce Tech, uh, which is a pioneering leader in the measurement, the monitoring and verification of natural capital within the global landscape, such as soil organic carbon, above ground biomass, soil moisture, and biodiversity. So we are very much into, into, into measuring over there. Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we hear you loud and clearly. Okay, good, good. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's been a, a great uh, morning so far. Um, good, good morning. I think. Oh no, I was one minute late. <laughs> I just missed it. So. Um, but yeah, it's been great to hear the contributions and um, as representing Downforce Technologies, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I wish that I could have joined you in person, but um, here I sit in Spain. So luckily, uh, we're talking about digitalization, I'm able to join you this way. So um, as, as uh, was introduced, um, Downforce Technologies is a, um, is a startup that is, um, uh, basically was co-founded by Jackie McGlade, who was the former chief scientist of the United Nations Environment Program, and also then uh, ran the European Environment Agency for, for 10 years prior to that. And effectively, um, the idea for Downforce was born um, off the back of the huge amount of public data that is available that was sort of at, at our fingertips, but maybe not being uh, utilized as as well as it could be to drive data-driven decision-making. Um, and so effectively, um, a platform has, has been built to fuse together millions of different data points um, and to try to um, support land managers on the ground with understanding what is happening based on historical data. So it's always, we're always looking back um, at, at what has happened of, of observed data. So, but we're not completely remote sensing. Um, if you're thinking about it on a spectrum, we're not completely ground truth data as well. We're effectively somewhere in the middle. Uh, we use both. Uh, we're very data hungry. So as as, um, as much as we can, we, um, we fuse together a stack of data to try to understand at a 10 meter by 10 meter resolution, a land parcel anywhere in the world. We've analyzed over 16 million hectares. Um, and we are able to um, sort of build a, a digital twin of the piece of land that we're, that we're looking at. Um, and that would include anything from soil type to bulk density to the slope aspect, climate data, all of that coming into it to sort of build what we call functional classes. And then we are able to layer on top of that every 10 days, 
um, satellite data coming in from the Sentinel satellites. Um, and that would include both radar as well as multispectral banding. So looking at what's happening on the ground, um, you know, how, how are we able to see variations in terms of the, the uh, soil organic carbon, looking at primarily what we're looking at rather though, than fluxes though, is trying to understand the long-term trends of the stocks, trying to understand if land management interventions are made, is the delta moving in the right direction? Are you sequestering more carbon and is it staying in the ground? As well as then also we're able to, um, to assess biodiversity at scale. Um, and that would be looking at habitats in terms of connectivity, uniqueness, diversity, quality, um, as well as then above ground biomass. So looking at, you know, lengths of hedgerows, the, the widths, the, you know, forests, the, the woodlands and whatnot. So, um, and we, so, so as I mentioned, we, can work both at farm level. We have done, uh, you know, feedback sessions to farmers where it's been you know, the aha moment of, wow, I can see based on you're showing me, you know, sort of the, the uh, visualization of what has been happening on my farm since 2017. And I can see, oh, right, that, that uh, field is, it appears to have lost a lot of soil carbon in 2019. That's when I plowed it under for potatoes, makes total sense. Um, and then, you know, we've, we also can work at scale and do assessments to help understand, um, for instance, we did an entire county in England, um, and that helps that county council then have a baseline in terms of understanding where are we at with the soil organic carbon and biodiversity, and how can we sort of use that to, to, to further some policy interventions that we might want to make. Um, I'm thinking about uh, biodiversity net gain in the UK. Um, and so um, we, so a large, a large part of what we aim to do is resonating with the, some of the things that I've heard today around equipping and empowering uh, data-driven uh, farmers to make data-driven decisions on the ground um, based on, on what they can see have having happened, uh, what has worked, what hasn't, um, and then understanding based on an apples to apples comparison, um, not just over the hedgerow because they might have a different soil type than you, they might be utilizing the land differently, but trying to understand based on these functional classes, um, you know, who, who in my area is performing, their land is performing potentially um, at a higher level than mine. So then, okay, you might have the, the capacity if you were to implement some type of sustainable practice, um, then you, you could potentially accomplish more soil organic carbon removals. Um, and so who, who is this data useful to as well? Um, and I heard it mentioned and it's, and it's absolutely true. Um, we're not just working with land managers on the ground, but then also throughout the value chain. So you'd be looking at, you know, food and beverage companies. Um, we also, you know, fiber, we're working with cotton growers um, and the cotton aggregator um, around how can the data then at portfolio view help them understand where, where they're at in terms of the, their net zero position and how might they be able to incentivize um, action on the ground to be able to move towards, um, you know, sort of if they're setting net zero targets, um, any of the alphabet soup of the, the global reporting standards, I'm thinking about GHG protocol and SPTI flag targets. Um, and as, as Kaylee mentioned for, for Pepsi, maybe it's, you know, regenerative agriculture type incentive programs. Um, and so providing that data in terms of what, what is happening on the ground and where might you target um, action and how, how might that look that's appropriate for the context of, of the farm that you're dealing with. Um, and one of the things that we also are, are very dedicated to um, is intercalibration and validation of the of the platform and trying to understand um, how all the data sets fit together and how we can best um, understand what's happening um, on the ground. And so um, we we ran a intercalibration study, well, multiple ones, but one in particular, um, where um, we used, you know, gamma ray and uh, EM um, a spectrometer, drones were flying, uh, deep core sampling, hyperlocal sampling, and all the different protocols. And one of the, the things that um, I think presents, presents a challenge potentially if we're making decisions off the back of 
um, potentially limited data is that that may have just been from maybe, and it's been mentioned already today, around up-to-date, robust, uh, comprehensive data um, because we have found that according to whichever protocol you're using, there could be um, as much as a 17% variability. And that's, again, hyper-local within the same field at the same day on the same day um, and point in time also being sent off to two different laboratories and coming out with different results. So those types of, um, of issues were very, we, we understand there's variability within the landscape and we embrace it and try to work with it. Um, so I think that that concept around trying to um, continuously enhance the, the, the data sets that are available and can be used to then, um, you know, uh, process and and uh, and uh, feedback uh, what what high quality results and, and robust data that, that then decisions can be made off the back of I think that's that's very important so I'll finish with that and uh, welcome any questions thank you okay thank you very much you certainly show that uh, someone within uh, within the field can be extremely enthusiastic <laughs> about uh, about what you're doing uh, thanks for that um, I'm moving uh, to the other side uh, of the world, and I am not able to say good morning. I will have to say uh, good evening, because uh, we also have uh, Dr. Kesuke uh, Katsura, and I just hope that I'm coming close to the, pr to the right pronunciation. He's an uh, associate professor of Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology, and we have heard before from uh, Frank Bokovic that small farmers uh, do have an interest and do have a link with digitalization and artificial intelligence. And if there is someone uh, who can tell us what, what can be done towards smallholders and how the focus can, put, can be put towards them, it's certainly Dr. Kaisuke Katsura. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for giving me such an opportunity. And actually, I'm not a na native speaker of English, so my accent would be strong for you. So may I? OK, thank you. I, I prepared some slides for you. Actually, I myself am an agronomist and crop scientist. And I have mainly worked on the development of sustainable cultivation techniques, in, mainly in developing countries. And in recent years, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, has become relatively easy for anyone to utilize and I have gradually begun to do similar research. Uh, okay, so today I would like to introduce uh, something about the AI agriculture technology that can be utilized in developing countries. So agriculture in developing countries differ from that in European countries or the one in the United States, uh, in that individual fields are very small. And in order to consider their food security and naturate information of the productivity of their crop is the most important first step in considering sustainable agriculture in the future. But in fact, it is not easy to investigate productivity in the field. There are several reasons for difficulties in yield estimation. One is that the individual fields are very small so that uh, we cannot utilize satellite remote sensing. And um, that due to inadequate field or crop management, even in a single field, uh, the, the rice grow, uh, crop growth or yield varies uh, largely. Uh, there are large special variations in yield and growth. And there is also a lot of harvesting loss. And uh, especially if the crops are grown for their own consumption, it is very difficult to trace their product. Uh, their product. So could you please go to the next? So we therefore aim to develop technologies that can be utilized in agriculture in developing countries. We are particularly interested in the use of smartphones. As many of you know, uh, smartphones are spreading around the world at an incredible rate. And many farmers have smartphones even in rural African countries. So with a smartphone, image data can be easily obtained anywhere. So we have been developing yield estimation technology by combining it with image analysis technology, which has been developed dramatically in recent years. So go to the next. So we used 
deep learning approach, which is very popular in these days. But the most important thing in developing the techniques to collect a variety of data sets. So we set up a research team and asked agricultural researchers and extensive officers, mainly in West African countries, to stand in rice field at the harvesting season, like the picture in the, in the upper left, and take images, and then conduct a yield survey of rice plants in the area where the images were taken. Yield survey, a uh, very time consuming, simple but very time consuming task, but because it is very uh, one of the most basic survey items. So agricultural research institutes carry out this kind of simple yield uh, survey for hundreds of plots every year. So what we actually asked them to do was to take images before the yield survey. So to the, uh, there is a lot of variable data available at the regional regional agricultural experimental station, so it is important to take uh, to make the best use of them. So as a result, we succeeded in collecting five, more than 5,000 data points, and now actually uh, it continues to increase, mainly from West African countries, and we got a great variety of data vari variation. So go to the next slide. So once the data set like, being built up, the rest is easy. Uh, using a reasonable deep learning network structure, yield can be estimated with extremely high accuracy. And we have confirmed that the accuracy is much higher than that of experts. Actually, this expert is me, but as uh, you, you see that uh, the accuracy is far higher, far better than me. So the technolo the, this technology has already been turned into an application and it's beginning to be disseminated to agricultural research institute, mainly in African countries. At this stage, what we can do is just estimating biomass or yield, but we are currently developing a nutritional diagnosis techniques uh, using smartphone. So if we are successful, <coughs> if we are successful, uh, we hope to be able to link this to sufficient fertilizer management, uh, which could be uh, applicable to the developing countries, uh, small uh, small holders, uh, farmers. Okay, this is uh, all of my presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Please. Uh, sorry, I I have a question um, concerning the chain between farmers and and buyers and users from the agriculture. Um, product. Um, I will ask um, the professor from Japan how are uh, the chain in Japan. I think the near of this chain is very long and uh, it's uh, have a very good impact on the price of the product. My question is how can you change this chain and short this chain uh, using some uh, artificial intelligence models. Huh? Uh, so that's my question. I'm sorry, I am an agronomist and um, my main interest is to develop a, uh, a crop management techniques. So I'm not good at about the food chain. So I'm sorry, but I cannot answer to your question. I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I thought I would just maybe jump in um, to, to address this question in, in some way, it might not totally answer it, but there are organizations out there. One I'm thinking of in particular is How Good, and they're, they're, one of their remits is try to, trying to understand where different commodities come from and understanding how supply chains work and who's sourcing from where. So there are things that are already being done, not by my company, but but by other people to try to understand because we've actually had conversations given the work that 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 my company does um, where we need to know the land parcel that we're assessing. And if the company is not like PepsiCo where they have long-term contracts, if they just randomly source from their commodities from wherever, it makes it, it's a disintegrated supply chain so therefore these types of solutions where we can understand okay it came from maybe this part of brazil so if we were to you know analyze at scale and try to understand what's happening there potentially those types of um 
that that data could be interesting to understand these uh, more or less integrated supply chains, if you will. But I, I, I think I don't know if that completely answers your question. We are working with a cotton grower, though, in in Australia who inserts a, a trace into the cotton bales and so is able to actually then market that to the end retailer or the brand who wants to you know have more sustainable cotton because they can it's 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 transparent it's, tra it's traceable of, as to where that goes um so there are different ways that people are coming up with solutions to try to to understand the flow of of products around the world um so that was just something i wanted to contribute okay i have one question for each of the panelists. If, if you would give advice towards the next European Parliament of the policy you really need uh, to make this happen, um, I would say you get two sentences from me each, okay? That's to, that's to check your, your intelligence. <laughs> okay, Kaili, what, what would be your question towards the next European Parliament. I believe there is still work to do on the data harmonization or interoperability or how to avoid that the grower using multiple tools needs to um, put the same data in into all these tools one by one and they can't easily transfer it. So somehow to automate uh, standard data Transfer, uh, tr transforming into uh, uh, or, or transferring from one one system to the other, so from their farm management tool to another tool that uh, they are they are using. So that would be one point, and maybe second point is um, the clarity of um, of targets, uh, clarity of definitions, not to have too many. Um, because then it will confuse uh, the people who need to deliver those. Um, that would be my um, two sentences. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, thank you very much. Steve? I think that before regulating, uh, we need uh, more uh, freedom to, to try uh, the possibilities of AI because uh, too early uh, regulation could be uh, negative to the, the benefits that AI can bring. So uh, I think regulation needs to be uh, a little bit uh, after uh, the practice and uh, be based on the practice and not uh, not the way uh, around, not the other way. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Beth. Your two sentences. Try to be brief. <laughs> um, the um, I think one of the things that's very interesting is the increasing reporting requirements. So there's the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, and what is required under those versus what's voluntary and um, and and what data that is based on. I think it, uh, if, if we could have sort of, um, you know, ground truth data, sort of like the, the, the results that we're able to show from Downforce, that, that type of data where we can see what has happened rather than trying to model forward and project what might happen. Um, I think that's something that, um, that could be very, very valuable um, and trying to, you know, have a handle on, the the companies then what's happening throughout their supply chain and do they know and how are they incentivizing change so i'll stop there okay thank you dr katsura okay so i think that the problem of small holders in developing countries are often different uh, from those in european uh, european countries so and a different approach may be necessary as uh, and uh, as a lot of data remains and uh, utilized in their each regions. So I believe it is important uh, to organize and utilize these data. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank my, uh, my four panelists, Beth, Kali, Steve, and uh, Dr. Katsura. Thank you very much for, for being with us, for giving uh, and sharing your thoughts. I would like uh, to invite the two respondents so that at least the last five minutes of this session, I'm not sitting here alone. <laughs> but I also have a task for you because I would like to ask you to give me, uh, let's say you get more than two sentences, but you, you get two minutes. Um, with what you learned this morning, what would be your advice to the next European Parliament?
Okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you to all the panelists. I think uh, that uh, we really got wiser about the state of play, and the state of play is uh, obviously furious, uh, and uh, in a very uh, important system, the food system, which needs to be uh, radically transformed systematically very fast, very soon, for the benefit of all involved, and this is a system where we're practically all involved. Uh, so, uh, my two sentences. Uh, first of all, I would like to... Um, let you know that in doing uh, the new uh, uh, statistics for agricultural inputs and outputs, we realized that in the European Union, which is probably the most regulated uh, food system uh, in, on the planet, uh, there was no um, standardized system for uh, um, taking the statistics. It was based on a uh, general person, a gentleman's agreement between the statistical organizations of each country state, member state, and it is now more harmonized. Uh, and there are issues with digitalization in the sense that um, we had to fight hard to get uh, the pesticides, for example, uh, usage uh, uh, data uh, annually uh, and not manually. Uh, they were, uh, they, they, since the farmers were obliged to keep the, the use of pesticides on a paper, which they, then the statistical organization would pick up uh, once every five years, perhaps, uh, and uh, we looked up the data and we saw that 75% uh, of, uh, of people living in the rural areas have phones. So, I mean, uh, you know, we, can, we can't, uh, I think that goes a long way to talk about the digital divide, the no's and the no-nots. So there is a big need for, um, for us and everybody in this room and everybody in this space to be out in the rural areas, to work on the startup villages, to work upon the innovation hubs, on the farming innovation hubs, and bring out these techniques which are critical, all this blockchain on traceability, on the um, uh, 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 stop of waste in the production and all that. There is huge space for improvement uh, in the profitability, in the sustainability of uh, the sector, and I would like to see that happen. And closing remark is that uh, we have also to look in the elephant in the room, and that is that uh, the CAP being one of the two biggest uh, funding instruments and most important uh, policies of the European Union in the last uh, decades, the other being the cohesion funds. Uh, both these instruments were designed and pretty much put in place uh, before we realized we need uh, the Green Deal. Uh, we need to break, to use an agricultural word, uh, break the silos, and uh, look at the food system not only as an agro problem, but as a public health problem, as a biodiversity issue, opportunity, let me say. So the big thing for the next parliament would be to design the upcoming uh, regional policy, uh, cohesion policy instrument and the uh, new uh, CAP in a way that um, takes under consideration the goals of the Green Deal, not only the climate goals, but also the toxicity goals and pollution goals and so on. Now, I understand this is not going to be very easy, given that uh, a very big party of uh, the Parliament, the EPP, puts out on a moratorium on everything that has to do with um, uh, food, uh, green and food in the past months, uh, in. Uh, in alliance with parties to the right of the APP. So this is going to be really very important, uh, what's going to happen in the European elections coming, for, going, coming forward, and um, also what is now happening in a number of countries where uh, farmers are expressing their frustration. Uh, so uh, with these words, I'll give the floor to Tas. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, I will come from a different angle and background. Uh, but uh, I want to focus not on two sentences, but three points uh, about what we discussed and my perception about that. It's about data. It's about the use of data. It's about the narrative of data. So around these three things, I think we need to keep in mind one thing that has been behind what we have been discussing, but not clearly stated. Digitalization and artificial intelligence are not about substituting human activity, but complementing it. And that's an extremely important element if we, don't, if we want to keep the genie in the bottle still. Now, when it comes about data, there is too much information out there. So there is a need for prioritization and a need for harmonization. This has been already 
uh, mentioned, uh, what Petros mentioned also is very important, and I was still in the Commission, uh, one of the last things I did is defending the pesticide yeah. information, and one of the interesting things that is, we're going to get data in 2028, and we have a target for 2030. So that shows the logic and the sequence of policy making. Second thing about the use of data, there is an enormous potential for the increase in productivity. And here, on the basis of my experience, we need to straight and forward address an issue that comes as a confusion. Productivity and productivism are not the same things. Productivity is an output to input ratio. So what is going in the output and what goes in the input matter, and there are ways of increasing productivity in a sustainable manner. And that's why it is extremely important to see what goes into the input and what we're able uh, to measure. And there is where the narrative of the data becomes very important. Because data is information, and information is storytelling. And storytelling could create myths, could create, reflect, or hide realities. And I think one of my frustrations in the last years of my uh, commission career has been how, oh, while the commission had a long history of basing itself on solid data to do analysis, at a political level, the need for solid evidence-based analysis is becoming less important, not in theory, but in practice, compared to what has become a debate on slogans and polarization. I mean, I think we all agree that we need a systems approach and a holistic approach and what have you. But this systems approach reflects asymmetries in the real world. Asymmetries within the European Union, across the globe, and we need to decide where we put the numbers and the data in. And here, one of the things that I have seen in my experience, both in the Commission, but the one I'm doing now, especially with IASA, is that there is a lot of information on the environmental uh, side, a lot of information on the economic side. Economic models, in a weak way, incorporate some environmental aspects. When you look at environmental models, the economy is absent. The price is absent. And if you look at the inflation rate now, if you look at the cost of production now, we cannot move into the green transition if we don't take into account how we can reduce actually the cost and shift the marginal cost curve in a manner that actually reflects sustainability growth. This is difficult, it is possible, and applies to all sorts of different practices. And that is, and my last point, if you look at the area of the environmental front, soil, water, and biodiversity, my point has always been that our priority should be on soil. Because if you do good things on soil, you do good things for air, water, and biodiversity. And because on soil, we have most data than in other areas. And we have the policy leverage on soil with the money that we give and the conditionality. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Tassos. Thank you, Petros. <laughs> what did I learn today is that, well, we started to form 12,000 years ago. 15 years ago, we asked our farmers to form ecosystem services. Only three to four years ago, we asked them to form carbon, and the future is clearly forming data. There is a saying in Dutch that if you want to have a good, simple explanation or a decision, we are speaking about sound farmers' intelligence. I truly hope that artificial intelligence is not going to change that. Thank you to my both respondents, to my panelists, uh, to, uh, to Antoine um, for session one, um, also to the organizing team uh, of the Forum for the Future of uh, Agriculture, the support team here of the European Parliament, and Frank Bogovic for making it possible to do this here at the European Parliament. And I thank you for you, you for being here or for looking at us online. Thank you very much.